see. Uh, welcome everyone to the April installment of the IPM Hour. Uh, today our speaker is Anthony Melithopoulos. Uh, he's an associate professor for pollination health at Oregon State University. Anthony received his uh, bachelor's of science degree in biology and master's in pest management from Simon Fraser and his interdisciplinary PhD from Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, his work has focused on understanding how pest management practitioners, especially um, uh, weigh the benefits and costs associated with pest management decisions, especially uh, decisions to use pesticides and the environmental costs associated with pollinator health. And today he will talk about the evolution of federal regulations to protect bees. Anthony? Thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm really pleased. I've been, a, um, I've been a recipient of Western IPM Center grants in the past. They've been really critical to the work that we do here in Oregon. Today, I'm going to be giving you a talk um, that comes out of my experience as an extension educator. And there's a QR code in the top right corner what I would really appreciate, this is a test talk in some ways. I wanna, um, I'm working with the uh, NAPSI Pesticide Task Force, uh, many members of which are on the call today. Um, and so I, I'm looking for feedback. This is uh, a talk that's uh, meant to be directed at pesticide educators like yourselves, uh, but also beekeepers and uh, more concerned members of the public. So if you could, as I'm going through, if you could jot me a quick note on things that might be cut, that should be cut, or things that are unclear, that'd be most appreciated. Now, as I mentioned, this comes out of my experience working as an extension educator, and I get, like a lot of you, get hundreds of questions each year asking whether or not a pesticide is safe to use around bees. In answering these questions, I'm sure you have this experience, I'm always struck by the fact that most people don't realize that pesticides are already regulated to protect bees, and that most of these answers can be found on the labels that are affixed to the pesticide container. My goal today is to shed some light on the foundations of this regulation and bring you up to speed with recent changes to better ensure that pesticides sold on the market have minimal impacts to bees. And as I mentioned, I'm in doing so, I'm joined together, at least in spirit, although on the call, by the NAPSI Pesticide Task Force. Um, the NAPSI, uh, this, this presentation ultimately originated from the monthly discussions that we have on the Pesticide Education Task Force of the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, of which I've been a member since 2018. For those of you who don't know, NAPSI is a collaborative body of more than 120 diverse partners, and we're all dedicated to raising pollinator-related issues to the benefit of the health of all species of pollinators, including vertebrates. Now, it's been a center for this mission for over 22 years and has a tri-national scope. The task forces, of which there are 10 in total, represent a cross-discipline, short-term project-oriented efforts designed to accomplish specific tasks. The Pesticide Education Task Force has worked on a number of projects, including a campaign to increase the reporting of bee kill incidences, working directly with the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture to disseminate best uh, management practices, as well as initiatives to guide gardeners, homeowners, growers, and pesticide applicators to reduce the exposure of pesticides to pollinators. Here I am. My journey to pesticide education came through the Oregon legislature. I think I've talked about this in the past to this group. 2013, 2014, there was a series of five incidences associated with the application of an insecticide to linden trees. Um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later that led to all these bumblebee deaths. The legislature wanted to prevent this from happening again and created my position to work across state agencies through an entity called the Oregon Bee Project on a comprehensive education program for pesticide applicators on how to minimize impacts of pesticides to pollinators. This puts me on the road a fair bit, training pesticide applicators on how to read pesticide labels, which has also resulted in a card produced and available from NAPSI helping pesticide applicators understand pesticide labels. Here's the card, it's a little pixelated, and I will point out that the North Central IPM Center has, uh, has contributed and we've, uh, in producing um, thousands of these cards that go out to pesticide education. And really that's the purpose of this card. It's to help pesticide applicator 
uh, applicators understand the compulsory directions as well as the advisory statements to minimize exposure of bees to pesticides. Now, these instructions, as well as others designed to protect other organisms that um, the pesticide is not targeting, are found on all pesticide labels, and people are shocked to know that this is the case. The methods for reducing exposure outlined on pesticide labels are also known as mitigations, and they're a critical tool for specifying how a pesticide that is toxic to bees can be used in a way that significantly reduces its impacts. What I want to focus on today is the process by which a regulatory agency is able to assess a pesticide and translate it into a pesticide label that specifies how a pesticide should be used to ensure the full benefit of the product can be realized without negatively impacting one specific group of non-target organisms, the ones I'm concerned with, bees. And before going too deep, I did want everybody to have the basic terminology out of the way. When we're talking about pollinating insects, we're often talking about insecticides. But if you pick up a newspaper, you'll see the word pesticides also used when talking about bees. People are always confused about this. What's the difference? A pesticide is a general term. It refers to any substance or mixture of substance that is intended to destroy, repel, or prevent a pest or pathogen. Within pesticides, there are groups specific to what are uh, uh, to the uh, product that is intended to target. Three groups are relevant when talking about pollinating insects. Insecticides target insects, herbicides target weeds, and fungicides target fungal pathogens. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's switch gears. I want to take this deep dive into pesticides and how they're regulated, and it's a, truly a deep dive. Hold on to your seats. How is risk? of pesticides assessed to bees by federal agencies. I want to do this, I want to, the first thing I want to do is make clear that state and tribal agencies also have the authority to regulate pesticides, but that for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus at the federal level. And I do think to properly understand the foundation of pesticide regulation, we have to go back to the beginning. After all, Pesticides weren't always uh, subject to regulation in the United States. Pesticide regulation is a product of the progressive era of the 20th century. It emerged from circumstances only tangentially related to pesticides. One of the sparks surrounding the need to regulate were, uh, were, were really health violations and uns unsanitary practices as you can see here in the US meatpacking industry, which was highlighted in Upton Sinclair's 1906 novel, The Jungle. Now, President Teddy Roosevelt famously branded Sinclair a crackpot, uh, but the public discontents that were expressed through this book no doubt motivated Roosevelt to bring about the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. This act forbade foreign and interstate commerce in adulterated or fraudulently labeled foods and drugs. The act had far reaching powers. It enabled the government officials to seize and condemn products for the, uh, from the market and fresh canned or frozen food shipped in interstate commerce had to be labeled as pure and wholesome. Just, you know, just to be clear, the underlying motivation of this legislation was very distant from the safety of bees. It was focused on protecting consumers from fraudulent activity. But it was this growing sensibility of protecting consumers that was at the heart of the first federal act regulating insecticides. The Insecticide Act of 1910 made sure that when someone bought an insecticide like this Pyrox product, it contained what the manufacturer promised. It also set purity standards and protected farmers from insecticides that were either ineffective or dangerous to use. Again, nothing to do with bees or pollinators but it set the stage for the federal government to regulate pesticides that were previously freely made, bought, and sold. The regulation of pesticides continued to evolve through the 30s, culminating in a landmark piece of legislation that came in the wake of World War II, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act of 1947. And I'm sure many of you have heard someone at a meeting talking about pesticides and bees blurred out the acronym FIFRA, and this is what they're referring to. Key provisions in FIFRA have established the basis for pesticide regulation until the present. Importantly, 
FIFRA recognized pesticides as economic poisons. This has to be underscored. When a pesticide is considered, it has to weigh the risks against the benefits to society that are provided. The point of balancing benefits and risk considered broadly is going to be important when we consider how risks to bees are evaluated today. FIFRA also required the Department of Agriculture to register all pesticides prior to their introdu introduction into the market. As you know, the process of companies registering a pesticide continues to the present. These pesticides also have to have warning labels that had to list the active or pesticidal ingredients. Again, this is something that continues right up into the present. But unlike today, the law did not provide a basis for the federal government to remove a hazardous pesticide from the market. Many credit this second popular book, name, namely Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, for bringing about the change that authorized the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, for being able to remove a pesticide from the market. Uh, uh, and this came in the 1964 amendments to FIFRA. In the book, Carson outlined research that showed that a widely used insecticide, DDT, was bioaccumulating in the food chain, resulting in the thinning of eggs in wrappers at the top of the food chain, most notably uh, among bald eagles. It was on the authority of the 1964 amended FIFRA that the Secretary of Agriculture revoked the registration for all products containing DDT. It was the first of many pesticides to have their registrations canceled under the act on the basis of unreasonable risk to the environment and human health, which were deemed to be too much to offset the benefits of these products. As a consequence, these products are prohibited from being used in the United States. For our purposes, the second big change to FIFRA took place in, 19, in the 1970s. In 1970, Congress transferred the authority of FIFRA to the newly formed Environmental Protection Agency. And this marked a shift in the focus of pesticides to be reasonably safe to use, which was the defining problem demanded by society in the early 20th century with the issues raised in uh, Sinclair's jungle to the reduction of unreasonable risk to human health and the environment, which were the new concerns uh, after World War II that were emblemized in uh, Carson's Silent Spring. This new policy focus was expanded by the passage of the Federal Environmental Pesticide Control Act of 1972, which amended FIFRA, in addition to the goal of no unreasonable effects to the, uh, uh, in, in addition to the goal of no unreasonable effects to the environment, it also set timelines to review new science on already registered pesticides. Finally, it divided pesticides into those that are available to the public uh, to purchase and use, and those that, uh, that only were available for sale and use by certified or licensed pesticide applicators. This last provision of the 1972 amendments to FIFRA is something I really wanna underscore. The significance of restricted use pesticides is explained in detail by Dean Hertzfeld, the retired pesticide safety education program leader in Minnesota. I interviewed him on the Oregon State University podcast pollination in episode 186. As he explains, with the formation of EPA stricter standards, many pesticides would have been canceled because they would have been deemed too hazardous. But these hazards were deemed by Congress to be something that could be minimized with additional education of certified or licensed pesticide applicators. Consequently, states required uh, that these applicators study and pass exams before they can use these restricted use pesticides. And in many states, they can retain their certification if they take continuing education courses like this one. In Oregon, I'm responsible for delivering the training on pollinator protection, and I've trained over 7,000 applicators in the state on how to read a pesticide label to understand what kind of mitigations are necessary to protect bees. I also train applicators who primarily use herbicides on how to use it in a manner that enhances habitat for bees. And that, by the way, was uh, supported by Western IPM Center. Consequently, this provision ensures that there's a tier of pesticide applicators who are trained to mitigate risk through their comprehensive understanding of what pesticide labels mean in practical settings. 
I know this is a lot, but I want to round out this introduction to pesticide regulation by reflecting on this history and noticing how regulation is not a static process. Pesticide regulation has been continually evolving to reflect new science and emerging concerns within society. Effectively, the process of creating laws attempts to keep pace with the emerging demands from society. If we know anything, the regulation of today will likely change to meet unanticipated demands that the future has in store for us. Bees certainly were not in the front of mind in 1910 or 1947 and even 1972. It's a relatively new concern that started to become apparent in the 1980s when beekeepers began to notice dead colonies after certain insecticide applications and became prominent in the 2010s. A robust regulatory system is one that can adapt to new challenges as they emerge, rather than one that is inflexible and unable to adapt. And when it comes to bees, the regulatory system has been flexible and has undergone a host of changes. A short history of assessing adverse effects to bees begins in the 1980s in the wake of some of these early insecticide incidences uh, that were experienced around the late 70s uh, and the 1980s. Over the past 30 years, EPA has required companies that register pesticides to supply, to supply data from laboratory and full field colony level studies to assess adverse effects to bees. This information helped determine whether a pesticide could be registered and if it required a statement on the pesticide label warning applicators of potential hazards. But in 2011, EPA issued a comprehensive interim guidance on additional acute and chronic toxicity studies of adult and larval bees, along with exposure studies in pollen and nectar, which, uh, with which to uh, quantify these risks to bees. This increased the amount of data on the, effect of uh, on the effect of pesticide companies needed to provide to get pesticide registered or re-registered. And the final milestone I wanna highlight came in 2014. Based on EPA's FIFRA scientific advisory panel, the agency in collaboration with California Department of Pesticide Regulation and Health Canada's Pest Management Regulatory Agency released guidance on assessing pesticide risk to bees. I want to spend the bulk of my time today trying to explain what has changed over 30 years. And I fear many of these changes have gone under the radar of many who are committed to protecting the health of our bees, including many beekeepers. But before I do this, let me sum up the key points from this introduction. If there's one takeaway, it's that FIFRA that under FIFRA, no pesticide should have unreasonable adverse effects on environment when used in accordance with the label, but the key word is reasonable. And what is reasonable must take into account the economic, social, and environmental benefits uh, the, uh, of the use of that pesticide, which I, have, I hope I've impressed to you is continually changing. I know that was a lot of history and laws. Let me take a moment to back up a minute to consider what risk means when it comes to bees and pesticides. In doing this, I will be switching gears to consider the present and how EPA has demonstrated flexibility when confronted with increased concern around the health of bees. Of course, public concern around bees has been prominent over the last decade, and perhaps one of the most galvanizing moments came in 2013 when a pesticide application in my home state of Oregon resulted in a series of significant kills of bumblebees. Let me take you back to National Pollinator Week in Oregon, 2013. It's a time of year when a popular suburban shade tree, the linden or lime tree, comes into bloom. Now, if you've ever seen one of these trees, they have an open flower and um, it has lots of nectar and pollen. And it comes at a time of year when some of the spring bloom is coming out. So it's very attractive. There's a lot of bees going to it. They also experience a tremendous buildup of aphids, which causes sticky honeydew on cars and sidewalks below. And so a certified licensed applicator uh, was called to treat these aphids in, a, uh, in a, a trees that were in a target parking lot with the insecticide product um, Safari, which is fairly, uh, um, and he did, the application was done fairly close to bloom. 
This resulted in one of the largest documented bumblebee kills ever with an estimated 50,000 bumblebees dead on the parking lot and it triggered a national public response. Oregon Department of Agriculture acted swiftly. As you can see here, they wrapped the trees with shade cloth eventually working through the Oregon legislature to restrict the use of similar products on linden tree. And notably, this is an example of an insecticide where the label already had warnings about the product being toxic to bees, which have spurred the efforts of myself and other members of our task force, an APSI task force, to improve education of, uh, to pesticide applicators through the pre-existing certification programs. But what I wanna draw your attention to is that this was an example of an insecticide that was applied at a time of year when it should not have been. An example of a situation that was a high risk to killing bees. So this term risk, it tells us about the magnitude and likelihood of an adverse effect like lots of dead bumblebees on the pavement as a result of exposure to a pesticide treatment. If we state this a little bit differently, risk is how likely a pesticide application is to cause an adverse effect and how bad those effects might be. We can break this up further when we consider the linden tree example again. Risk is basically the product of these two things. The first one being, it should be obvious to you, the toxicity of the pesticide. A pesticide that is more toxic to bees will have worse impact on bees or a greater magnitude of effect. But toxicity alone doesn't translate directly into risk. Consider this linden tree. When it isn't blooming, you won't find bees visiting and contacting this tree. It has, therefore, a small likelihood that bees will be exposed, making the risk low. Of course, this assessment changes drastically when the linden tree comes into bloom. It literally will hum with a wide array of bee species. Exposure with a pesticide applied at this time, as in the case with that parking lot example that I showed you earlier, is very high. Situations where a pesticide that is toxic to bees is applied on a bee attractive plant that is in bloom can result in a high likelihood that there'll be a large adverse effect to bees. As you can imagine, this is much more complicated process in real life. An individual bee may have a range of sensitivity to pesticides. We know, for example, that genetic variation, age, or species of bee can vary in sensitivity uh, to a pesticide, to a given pesticide. Likewise, exposure varies by the environmental conditions when a pesticide is applied. How many times a bee is exposed itself to the pesticide, for example, if it returns to the treated plant multiple times or just once. So guidelines for risk assessment are crafted in such a way as to estimate risk from data generated from the lab and field experiments in a manner that anticipates the variability inherent in such a complex and dynamic system. Let me move to the risk assessment process used at the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA estimates risk in the real and complex world from these snapshots of data that are provided when a pesticide is registered or reevaluated. Let me preface my remarks by stating that this is a very complicated endeavor and that I'll only be able to talk about this process in broad strokes. There's considerable nuance in risk assessment that is impossible to convey in the brief time we have today. Fortunately, EPA does a has a fantastic page dedicated to the topic of risk assessment and pollinators, and you can use the QR code on the screen by holding your camera up and just um, turning it on and going to the, the website that'll take you to the page, or you can simply Google the terms EPA, how we assess risk to pollinators. I also think uh, excellent background on this topic can found on YouTube in a uh, webinar EPA gave in 2020. I'd highly recommend this video and you can again access it using the following QR code. The problem of taking complex problems of bee exposure in the environment is tightly interwo interwoven with the biology of bees, as Fred Whitford put uh, from Purdue Express in this in episode 213 of the Pollination Podcast. As Fred says, EPA's approach to risk assessment is only understandable when considering bee biology. Which brings me to my third recommendation for resources, namely a publication that Dr. Whitford uh, put together that draws a parallel between EPA's data requirements 
and the Biology of Bees. I would highly recommend this publication as a starting point. At the heart of this framework is a tiered process of assessing risk. This tiered approach is consistent with the more expansive framework that has been evolving within EPA under the broad umbrella of ecological risk assessment. What is ecological risk assessment? I mean, it, it spans more than just bees, but the key principle is that tests required to evaluate the effects on non-target organisms like bees are arranged in a hierarchical or tiered system progressing from laboratory-based studies of individual honeybees to field-based studies of honeybees of honeybee colonies. The overall process is intended to identify those chemicals which are not considered likely to be an issue for bees and enabling the agency to better allocate resources and testing to those chemicals which appear to be problematic. And this looks like spaghetti, but in broad strokes, let me move you through. From As you move from tier one to tier two to tier three, the determination of risk becomes increasingly refined as the data approaches field or actual use conditions, which is, you know, the this spaghetti you're seeing on the screen is arranged from tier one all the way to tier three. The point is that as you move down this graphic, additional data are considered to characterize potential risks. If data are not available, then risk becomes more uncertain, and in the absence of data to the contrary, the agency may presume risk. This is too much to digest just looking at this. So let's, I'm going to walk you through some, uh, an example. Let's go through each of the steps, um, each of the kind of course steps in this, um, in this tiered system. Now, tier one starts with the most basic question. Are bees likely to be exposed? This involves understanding whether uh, the crop may be attractive to bees, whether applications occur near bloom, and the time at which compounds are applied. A key element is looking at the plants the pesticide is being proposed to be used on. In this, uh, in this crop, uh, is, uh, it, the question is, is this crop one where there's even a potential for exposure to bees? To answer this question, EPA, EPA evaluates multiple lines of information, including the following USDA document that summarizes the attractiveness of a crop to bees and whether it uses contracted pollination as part of its production. Even if a pesticide is not proposed for use on a pollinator attractive crop, EPA will still evaluate the risk of the bees that might be foraging adjacent to the treated crop. So you might, you might imagine that there's a, a crop that's right next to a bee attractive crop in the landscape. They may still evaluate um, that product, even if it's being proposed for something like grass that doesn't attract, a grass seed that doesn't attract bees. Here's an excerpt from that USDA guide. The second line, sugar cane, for example, is neither attractive to honeybees, bumblebees, or solitary bees, which is indicated by the negative signs that you see there. Now let's look at another crop. Here we see sunflower, and it has two plus signs indicating high attractiveness, including a listing of generic names of the many species of solitary bees that visit sunflower. Moreover, the guide indicates whether managed pollinators are used are used to pollen are used in pollinating that crop, which in the case of sunflower is yes. Consequently, a pesticide being considered for sugarcane may be characterized as being of minimal risk to bees, whereas the same pesticide being considered for sunflower may be may require higher tier studies if risk estimates exceed the agency's level of concern and risk can't be mitigated effectively through label language. Now, all this information about the attractiveness of crops is found in this USDA document, and it's available online. If exposure is likely, then laboratory tests are required on the effects of the product on individual bees. And this is the starting point of the Tier 1 testing in the lab. Here's a list, here's an inventory of the laboratory tests required now. These are new, many of these tests have been used since the 80s, but there's since 
since this new risk assessment procedure has been put in place, there are additional tests. There's a lot on these tables, so let me highlight a few of the key elements. Tier 1 tests include, include acute toxicity tests where bees are exposed once to a pesticide, as well as chronic tests where a bee is exposed repeatedly over time. It involves tests of adults as well as tests of larval bees. I kind of screwed that up there. Uh, the larval bees, you can see the uh, the lat. There's the the larval bees are indicated. There's a couple of them. There's a come up with larval tests and adult tests throughout. Uh, and also a sets, which as you see at the bottom, whether it contacts the bees, uh, whether it, um, it's done by contact or oral ingestion routes. It involves tests of adult bees as well as larval bees. Many of these tests differentiate between the toxicity of whether the, of the bee eats the pesticide or whether it contacts it physically. Now that's just tier one. Remember all pesticides go through tier one if the crop, um, if the crop that they're being applied to is deemed to be attractive to bees. So how are these tier one laboratory tests carried out? Here's an example of just two of the tests that I showed you in that big table. On the top panel, you can see an adult honeybee being dosed with a drop containing varying concentrations of a pesticide in the acute contact toxicity test. On the bottom panel, you can see the chronic larval test where a honeybee larva is fed a standard diet with varying amounts of pesticide. The larva developing over a three week period after the start of the tests uh, which, uh, allows allows the toxicologist to view the effects across the entire developmental period of the bee. Now, I want to point out that honeybees are used as a surrogate for other bees in these tier one tests, primarily because they're really available and there are well-defined tests uh, for these bees. But this is not to say that EPA does not evaluate data using other bee species at the tier one phase, just that the bulk of the tests are done on honeybees. These tests are summarized in two ways. The test results have um, one of two acronyms that you, this group has heard of, LD50, which is the amount of pesticide applied to a bee, which causes 50% uh, uh, death to 50% of a test population of honeybees. But also when it comes to the uh, chronic effect tests, the no observable effect level. Um, and so let's just look at these two concepts in, in practice. So the toxicologist doing the test will note a range of impacts on bees, um, um, for example, sublethal effects, including changes in their behavior. But a key measurement is going to be how many of the bees in the test population die. The summary for the acute test is frequently expressed as the, as the LD50. For chronic exposure tests, the data are often summarized in terms of the highest dose or level where the pesticide has no observable adverse effect on the bees the no, uh, Noel. This means the dose where the toxicologist can discern no measurable difference between the treated bee and the bee in an untreated control as it develops through this, uh, for, in this example, as it develops from uh, a larva to an adult. The next step is to take these test results and contextualize them with respect to how much of the pesticide the bee is likely to encounter in the field after application. Take, for example, this worker bee visiting white clover flowers. How much of a pesticide is she likely to be exposed to by contacting the flower and ingesting the nectar and pollen? This term, this estimate, is uh, the environment, estimated environmental concentration, or EEC. Here's a representation of how, the, how data from one of the tests, the adult acute contact tests, which we sh uh, showed in that previous in one of the previous slides is used to reflect on what's going on in the real world. The test results are put in context with the expected exposure a bee would have come into contact with the estimated environmental uh, concentration. But how on earth does one even estimate the amount of pesticide a bee would be exposed to in the environment without directly measuring it? EPA looks at what is being proposed for the application rates the chemical properties of the pesticide and other factors, and then come up with the worst case scenario. This calculation is made for each road of exposure and for each crop that the pesticide is being registered for. If the risk quotient is above a certain level of concern, 
then further refinements are required to assess the risk of the pesticide. In contrast, if the risk quotient falls well below the level of concern, then the pesticide may be characterized as being of minimal risk to bees. So let's say a pesticide had an LD50 of 100 parts per million. That is to say, if you applied a diluted solution to the body of the bee that contained a, a thousandth of an ounce of pesticide in a gallon of water, 50% of them would likely die. But an adult bee traveling through the environment is likely only to contact 15 parts per million of the pesticide in her lifetime when the pesticide is applied to a cherry tree at a specific rate at a specific application. This gives you a risk quotient of 0.15. Since the threshold of uh, level of concern is 0.4, this type of application may be characterized as of minimal risk if the same conclusion um, if the same conclusion was arrived at for all the other modes of exposure. So orally contact the, uh, uh, the larval develop uh, uh, chronic tests. Now you may ask yourself, what does a level of concern of 0.4 even mean? Levels of concern are based on bee toxicology and are set at two levels. For acute exposure, when a bee is expected to contact um, the pesticide once, the level of exposure is set at 0.4. Which, is typ which typically is set to a, um, a background mortality of 10%. For scenarios where the bees expected to repeatedly uh, um, be exposed, the chronic uh, or chronic exposure, the level of concern is set to one, which is essentially equates with a no observable effect level. So in contrast, if the pesticide had a lower LD50 instead of 100 parts per million, it was 10 times more toxic with an LD50 of 10 parts per million, it would exceed the 0.4 level of concern threshold, and the registrant may be required to provide additional data to further refine the characterization of risk for that pesticide. Now, I hope you can appreciate kind of going through this example, which is very dense, I know, a lot rides on the environmental estimated environmental concentration. To help refine this exposure, what you know what this is, EPA may require the registrant of the pesticide to spray those cherry trees and collect samples of pollen and nectar and see if that conservative estimate that they used uh, in the tier one assessment really reflects what's uh, actually going on in the world. So say, for example, rather than 15 parts per million, the actual amount of bee would encounter in the environment is much lower. This would suggest that risk is even lower than that predicted by the initial tier one estimate. The long and short is that measured residue levels in pollen and nectar can be used to refine these risk estimates. In many cases, however, the risk to bees cannot be characterized by tier one tests alone. While measuring residues in nectar and pollen on sprayed plants may refine the characterization of risk, further refinement may be required and more testing uh, under more realistic uh, uh, exposure scenarios. This means moving beyond the lab to, from in, and away from individual bees to whole colony level evaluations of lethal and sublethal effects in semi-field or full field experiments. Tier two tests could include experiments uh, where a colony of honeybee is provided with a diet spiked with pesticide at varying concentrations. It may also involve an experiment shown on your right where the bee colony is restricted from foraging on anything but the treated plants by enclosing both bees and treated plants within a tunnel. Tier three tests are even larger in scale where the entire replicated fields will be treated with pesticide and impacts on the colonies measured. It's worth noting, though, that increasing realism comes at a cost. Here are the figures from Dr. Whitford's Complex Life of Honeybees. While, while the array of Tier 2 semi-field tests may be three times that of the Tier 1 tests, the full Tier 3 field trials are almost 10 times that of the Tier 2 tests. The tiered framework provides a, a, a way to keep costs down for testing pesticides that are relatively low risk to bees while providing full scrutiny of products where toxic impacts may be less clear. Clearly, for the tiered risk assessment to provide reliable risk characterization, the data that's collected must be collected in a robust manner. 
This bit, and it bears asking the question, how is the data generated for these studies? Now, there's a real detailed account of this approach to generating data uh, from two researchers in Canada who uh, were involved with running a tier three study for an insecticide used in canola. I know both of these folks really well. Dr. Uh, Scott Dupree uh, did her graduate work in the lab that I came from, and Dr. Cutler was my PhD supervisor. Here's the reference, here's the refereed publication describing this uh, account, uh, describing the work that they did. When you go through the materials and methods section, you'll notice in the first sentence that the researchers used good laboratory practice, which is described in two citations. If you follow that citation, it leads to the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, which has a lot of numbers and things in there that I don't under quite understand. Um, so somehow whatever data they generated was guided by the Code of Federal Regulations. And I have to say, I didn't know what the Code of, Fo a code of Federal Regulations was, so I looked it up. The Code of Federal Regulations codifies general and permanent rules that federal agencies like EPA have to adhere to. If we look more closely at what the EPA has to, has to adhere to, a key part is in section 158. This part requires that pesticide applicants and registrants to register data to support product registrations. Um, it, it specifies what they have to do. The data requirements are specified in the code. What it says is that pesticide companies have the responsibility to generate data using good laboratory practices, but also that EPA sets the guidelines for these tests. So what does good laboratory practice involve? Fortunately, Dr. Cutler and Scott Dupree wrote the following piece in the journal Bioscience describing their experience. In the introduction of the paper, they raise a question that I, have ha I certainly have had, and I'm sure many of you have also had, how can you trust data provided by companies that are looking to sell a pesticide? The answer to this is, is, the, the, is what's laid out in the law on the Code of Federal Regulations under good laboratory practices. As Cutler and Dupree point out, the impetus for the development of good laboratory practices in the 1970s was concern about the validity of the non-clinical safety data submitted to the Food and Drug Administration in the US, stemming from a number of incidences of the incompetent in execution of the studies. Uh, and also that there was insufficient documentation of methods and results and even an outright, fa outright fraud. As a consequence, GLPs were developed as a way to ensure that every step of the study was actively scrutinized during the experiment through the use of independent quality assurance personnel. As Cutler and Scott Dupree discovered, the quality assurance personnel are actively monitoring the research across all stages of the experiment. They noted that on several occasions in their study on canola, the quality assurance personnel identified transposition errors that occurred from the data sheets to the electronic spreadsheets, as well as an ambiguous note recorded by technical staff illustrating the thoroughness of their oversight. Um, and just to conclude, I wanted to end on this account by Cutler and Scott Dupree uh, of the extent to which third-party validation works independently of the people actually collecting the data as they recount the quality assurance personnel would on occasion put on a bee suit and see how the data was being collected and whether the integrity, consistency, and reproducibility of the data was being upheld in the study. Now, I'm at the conclusion. I want to just point out where the rubber hits the road. After the risk assessment is complete, the pesticide may only be registered under the provision that the pesticide applicator use the product using specific mitigations to ensure exposure to bees remains low. How is this communicated? All pesticides have a, a detailed label outlining the use of, uh, outlining how to use the pesticide safely. The label contains all kinds of specific information that is not conveyed by looking at the packaging. Take these two hypothetical, but actually quite real pesticide products. They look totally different from the outside, but in fact, they're the same pesticide marketed in two different ways. The instruction for using these products outlined on the pesticide label, in contrast, is identical. There's a lot of information on the label, but I want to just focus in on the sections relevant to protecting pollinating insects. 
to begin with, you know a pesticide, as a general, uh, for those of you who've never looked at a pesticide, the pesticide often has a little booklet attached to it. Um, the product name will be there, and this is called the front pack. You'll know it's a pesticide because there'll be an EPA registration number on the pesticide. And if you go through this pesticide, open the booklet up, you'll first be confronted with general use directions, directions for use and specific restrictions that apply to all uses of this pesticide, no matter if you're using this product on roses or you were using it on an ornamental cherry. As you go through this little booklet, you come to the specific use directions. It tells you if you're using this for roses, ornamental, evergreens, and flowers, the specific rates that you are going to apply this product, any kind of restrictions. For example, you notice in the end of the second last paragraph, it says do not exceed six applications per year on flower on flowers and roses. But finally, we're going to come to us, you'll come to a section on the label called the environmental hazard sections. And you can see on this bonide product right at the bottom, it has a bee caution. This product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment on flowering uh, on blooming crops or weeds. I want to point out that this has been the case for a long time. There's been environmental hazards uh, for bees on products for decades. What's new, and we can see this on some of the newer labels, and this is where the risk assessment is uh, truly starting to have impacts on labels, is when you look in environmental hazard sections, you'll see some of the standard language, but it'll say at the end, you need to follow label directions to reduce risk to be bees and organisms. And what's new is when you go into some of these products, you'll see under specific use directions, very clear language to the applicators on what they need to do to be in compliance uh, and apply this product in a way that is consistent with the findings of the risk assessment. Again, all this material is um, uh, on, uh, the kind of specifics on how to understand a pesticide label uh, is covered in these infographic cards, which you can freely download from the NAPSI Pesticide Task Force website. Um, and um, so check out the task force website for additional information information on pesticide safety around pollinators. And um, uh, I know we covered a huge amount of ground, um, but I, I do think that understanding how pesticides are regulated to protect bees and the updated tiered risk assessment process is critical for anyone looking to help bees. I feel that these recent changes have largely, done, have largely happened without a lot of notice. And I hope you've left today with a better understanding of what is entailed in these changes. Oof. Yeah, that was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> you can breathe now. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Anthony. That was that was terrific. Um, let me just mention <laughs> that if, if folks have questions, you can either drop your question into the chat or you can take your mic off mute. It is up to you to decide how you want to do that. Um, or you can raise your hand if you want to do that. You can do that as well. Uh, I, I, I hope you don't mind if I ask the first question, Anthony. Um, Please. At the recent entomology uh, Pacific Branch meeting of the Entomology Society, we talked a lot about public confidence in regulatory processes, and and this has been something that's been going on for a while. So. I'm curious to know if you have any comments about how that confidence, which has been undermined by a variety of, you know, political processes, as well as, um, you know, some of the registrants, how, how that winds up playing out in something like, you know, when somebody reads this label, or, or do they believe what they're reading? Well, um, again, nicely, uh, um, uh, work sponsored by Western IPM Center that uh, we'll be publishing soon on residual toxicity sections of labels, which supplements earlier work we did looking at acute toxicity sections of label, point out that there's errors. There's inconsistencies in labeling. And I suppose, you know, that one, the cynical view is that, you know, the system is broken and there's nothing, um, you know, one should wash their hands of it. But I do think when you go through and you look at the work, my, my frustration, I suppose, comes from this. We've had a decade and a half of sustained interest in bee health. And EPA has actually responded and put a, a framework in place that is for 
you know, we should we should be looking to expand this to other non-target organisms. And my sense is that the cynicism has gotten in the way of actually kind of like putting pressure, continuing to build on what has gained. My worry is that attention falls away because I think there's, you know, the, the history of pesticide regulation, there has been this blossoming of attention, some legal protections put in place, and then attention comes off. And I think if the one thing I would love to emphasize from this talk is that we should really be paying attention to this and we should be pushing it and we should, you know, be checking labels. We should be checking that this process has been complied with because it is quite robust, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Otherwise we're just going to be cynical. Right. I did want to mention to folks that Anthony has put his um, email address in the chat. So if you would like to provide feedback or comments to him, you can just, I think you can just copy that and drop it into your email program and send him comments. They can be kind of brutal and blunt too. Like that sucked that part there. Like just like, you know, even that full sentence, it can be like unpunctuated. Yeah, like the spaghetti diagram. <laughs> yeah, spaghetti diagram sucks. <laughs> uh, yes, Stephanie has her hand up. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yes, I'm curious to know, you know, I'm not sure I, I might have missed how long this tiered process has been around. Um, I think it's been around as long as I've been studying pesticides. Um, but, I, you know, that hasn't, I'm not that old, so <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, but I'm curious as to how many, um, how many pesticides have actually gone through that process since it has existed. Do you happen to know that? I'm not sure. Like the neonics, I think, were the test case, the nitro, uh, the nitro group neonicotinoids. Um, and I, I think it's been, uh, um, and I'm starting to see labels now. So I've seen labels that are come onto the market with newer diamides that clearly have different label language. And that's my sense of what's been put through. I don't know if others on this call have any sense of how you would track. I guess you would you know the registration date so this is after 2014 and um how you would know that, that that's a good question stephanie i think for for us as um people doing ipm there's you know there's there are some breadcrumbs to follow that aren't fo largely followed but i would i would say that the, the card has been revised uh uh in close collaboration with registrants and epa to ensure that it sort of covers off what's on new labels. And the great example of this is the B diamond, which is largely being retired. That everybody thinks is like, you know, an indication of B health or a kind of scrutiny. The newer labels are much more comprehensive. The language is clearer. Um, and it, it, I think there's a more harmonization, but it's gonna take years. So we've got old yeah. chemistries that won't be reviewed for a while and for that language to be updated. Yeah, unfortunately, um, Alyssa Arnold, who is at um, USDA Office of, it says OPMP, which is Office of um, Pest Management Policy, I believe is what that stands for. She was on the call and, and she might have actually had an answer for you, Stephanie. So, um, but I'm not seeing her on the list of participants currently. So I think she may have dropped off. But she would certainly be someone, someone at OPMP yeah, maybe Alyssa, um, and I can drop Alyssa's email address into the chat. She she might be able to get at that answer for you. Let's see. Um, oh, Steve, sorry. I, uh, Steve has his hand, hand up. You, you might have said this and I missed it because there was a lot of information, but what percentage of of products are getting to a tier three test do you have a, a sense of that no i think epa would i've heard anecdotally that everything goes to tier two these days okay that very very few products stop at tier one but i don't know this um you know i don't know this for a fact but i've heard from registrants that it's very hard to sort of you know have risk to find sufficiently for epa at tier one my sense is that tier three has done very like the the registrant really is going to want that product to go like it's it's having problems at tier two it's not characterized properly and 
then the agency comes back. My sense is that tier two is done almost all the time and tier three done, but I don't know to be, to be frank. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Stephanie, do you have a second question? I Sorry, see your yes. hand, your sort of hand up. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to monopolize the questions. But, so, you know, feel free to stop me at any time. You want um, me to go ahead and mute you? <laughs> Preferably <laughs> not, but you know, no. <laughs> whatever floats your boat. Um, yeah, I, oh, I think my question has just escaped my head. Oh, I'm sorry, Steph. I will come back to it if I, if it comes back to me. I, I guess one thing that I did want to quickly mention is that I, even though the, the, the more robust risk assessment um, was laid out in 2014, EPA was already using, I think this is the, the one thing to keep in mind. It wasn't like an abrupt shift when EPA suddenly said, these are the tests. Like EPA had, was accepting data from registrants or requiring data in a kind of piece, I don't want to say piecemeal, but in a kind of case by case basis for more data, but you know, it's, it's now become a requirement. I think I remember it. So, <laughs> Um, so is is the data on um, concentrations of pesticides in nectar and pollen, is that only like a tier three level of testing or is that a standard uh, thing that they need to collect now? It's my understanding it's taken at the it's taken to help better where there there is a case to be made that and I don't know how you know how the person doing the risk assessment, you know, how that judgment is exercised, but it's really to refine tier one estimates. So when I had that formula with the estimated environmental um, concentration, they may say, well, we're not quite sure. This doesn't, you know, so we want, as we're doing the tier one calculations, let's get some nectar and pollen data uh, to be able to come up with a better estimate. But I don't know, like a lot of these issues, I think are, would, just coming back uh, to Matt's earlier point, it would be nice to get, you know, more clarity or requests from EPA, you know, because I think some of this is opaque. I mean, if the risk assessment procedure is opaque, how, you know, how decisions are being made may also not be altogether clear, but it's worth kind of asking. And I think, um, you know, trying to get at how a existing quite robust risk assessment procedure is being operationalized is, I think those are great questions to ask of EPA. And I, in my experience, they're always willing to sort of provide that information. Yeah, actually all of the risk assessments are published in the federal register. And I've had the unfortunate uh, experience of trying to wade through some of them, uh, which is really a tedious and laborious process. Not the least of which is because of the number of acronyms in there. Uh, you know, it just, it makes the, the documents incredibly hard to read. Um, so it's, it's really, I mean, I, I know that they are there, you know, they're basically laying it all out there for you to read, but when you try and read it, it's, it's really like trying to, you know, suck a really heavy milkshake through a really thin straw. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, there's a comment. Um, I believe EPA is requiring exposure and effects testing on bees for pesticides going through registration review as well. Uh, pollinator mitigation is included in the interim registration decisions, and those interim registration decisions are announced through the Federal Register. Um, and the Federal Register uh, for EPA has actually, it's a daily dump for the Federal Register that you can actually subscribe to. So if you want to try and find those, you, you can actually find them. And in addition, um, we don't generally do this, but um, uh, I know that Al Fournier at uh, Arizona, University of Arizona um, has, a, has a newsletter where he announces uh, new EPA regist uh, re registration reviews that are coming up. And some of the, you know, some of the information we get from OPMP, he, makes all of that available through his newsletter. Um, so, so there are a variety of ways of actually pulling that information in sort of layman terms as opposed to the dense risk assessments that EPA puts out. Okay. Uh, oh, and there we are. For Federal Register documents current there. Yep. All right. So uh, I'm not seeing any more questions. So thanks, Anthony. I just wanted to mention that the next IPM hour is set for uh, May 10, 
where Gino Graziano is going to talk about the use of herbicides to control invasive woody plants and produce weed-free products in Alaska. Thanks, everyone.